God is so much better than we think. So it's time to change the way we think about him. God is good. More than a positive thought, theological concept, or biblical statement. What you do with these three words defines your reality and determines your destiny. In a world of fear, disease, crisis, torment, uncertainty, and hopelessness, what you believe about God reveals how you will respond to the trials and circumstances of everyday life. Your view of God impacts everything. Well, good morning, everybody. It is so good to be here with you guys today. My name is Chantal, and I am a lead pastor here. Um, And before we jump into our sermon this morning, I just wanted to thank Kristen for sharing her story. Uh, That was so incredibly powerful, right? Hearing about the goodness of God in the midst of the hard. You know, Jacob and I had the wonderful privilege of meeting Kristen and Chris, her husband, when they moved to Yakima, and they were in our room group and then in our life group and we have become wonderful friends Um, and I can tell you from friendship experience that she is living out and walking out the things that she talked about this morning. So thank you Kristen wherever you are for sharing that incredible story. Today we get to walk into week four of our series God is Good and as a recap to us all uh, during week one we talked about the magnitude of the goodness of God. How his goodness is beyond anything that we could ever think or imagine. During week two, we address the goodness of God in the Old Testament, you know, and we learn that it is sin that separates us from God, not God separating us, uh, separating himself from us. And then last week, Jake talked about the journey that is faith and the adventure of seeking the goodness of God in our lives. If you were here, you will remember that he used an Easter egg hunt analogy, and I love this so much because it painted such a cool picture of the goodness of God. He, he talked about how Easter egg hunts are supposed to be really fun, right? They're full of joy, laughter, and as the adult hiding the eggs, we get no satisfaction when the kids that are looking for the eggs can't find them. And as the person on the hunt, it's not fun for us to be on an egg hunt and not be able to find a single egg, right? God's goodness, Jake likened God's goodness is like an Easter egg hunt with Easter eggs laid out all over our front yard, easily seen and easily found. This week, we're going to be switching gears a little bit. We're going to be talking about not just the goodness of God, but a characteristic of his goodness. And this is found in the imagery of God being a father. So I want to start out this morning by asking you a rather seemingly simple question. And my question for you this morning is, why did Jesus become man and come to earth? Why did Jesus become man and come to earth? Now, if you've been in church for any amount of time, you might be coming up with responses in your mind and be thinking things like, you know, Jesus came to forgive our sins. So true. Uh, He came so that we can have life and life abundantly. One of my favorite verses, John 10, 10, also true. He came to fulfill prophecy. Again, true. These are all really good and true answers. But but today I want to challenge us with a different answer by saying that although all of those reasons of why Jesus came to earth are true, they by themselves miss the main and primary reason for his coming. Jesus' primary reason for coming to this earth was, in fact, to reveal God the Father. The reality is that every other possible response to that question is a sub-point to the main point. Now, the hardship in this reality is that the beauty of this truth is often lost in our culture today because of our skewed and broken view of family culture. I have over the last several years of walking with Jesus found that each and every person has their own view of who God is in their life. And the lens, the filter through which they see the goodness of God is typically through their experience with their earthly father. If there are a couple hundred of us right now in this room, and we as a generalization are all reading the same Bible, we're singing, we sang the same worship songs this morning, we're all gonna hear the same message this morning, how is it possible for so many of us to have differing perspectives of who God is and the level of his goodness? My argument would be that much of the way 
and amount of God's goodness that we allow ourselves to perceive is based on our nuclear family experiences. Notice I didn't say experiences in general because I know lots of people, Kristen being one of the people that just shared her story, that have not been dealt an easy hand in life, right? Who have gone through significant trauma, loss, death, disabilities, all kinds of things, and yet still say with conviction that God is good. So if Jesus' primary reason for coming to earth was to reveal the Father, what does that mean for us today? As Max talked about a couple weeks ago, the goodness of God was never missing in the Old Testament. In fact, his goodness is seen all throughout Old Testament scripture. One of the ways uh, that we see God's continual display of grace and mercy towards his people was the way that he continued to pursue the Israelites as they strayed, no matter how faithful God was to them. Right? We see throughout scripture that the Israelites, despite having been rescued uh, by God from slavery, despite having been provided for supernaturally in the desert, despite God speaking to Moses to the point, I read this in my devotions this week, God was, uh, Moses was with God on the mountain to the point when he came down from the mountain, his face was radiating. Like that's how much he was in the presence of God. He was literally glowing, okay? So Moses comes down with the 10 commandments, all of this proof, all of the ways that God has been good to the Israelites and still they managed to lose sight of God's goodness. And time and time again, they begin worshiping other idols made from their own hands. And every single time they cried out to God to deliver them, once again, he did. Yet the goodness of God in the Old Testament is lost for many people because uh, the difficulty, I think, that we have reconciling cultural differences um, from now to what it was then, wars, disasters, But when Jesus came onto the scene in the New Testament, and again, Jesus came to reveal the Father and therefore brought a face to God's goodness, it became personified in him. Both the mystery and the revelation of God's goodness are contained in Jesus. John chapter 14 is an incredible chapter in where Jesus confirms to his disciples that he and God are one. Starting in verse five, and this is subtitled in my Bible as Jesus, the way to the father. You can follow along. Scripture will be up on the screen. Verse five, it says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going. So how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am living in the Father and that the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. So we see in this passage of scripture that when we see Jesus, we see the Father. And Jesus only does what the Father is doing. I want to read another passage to you, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, In the past, uh, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And so everything that we love and admire about Jesus is a precise and calculated manifestation of the Father. God is the Father, and the Father is good. So what are characteristics of a father? You know, I think that there are a lot of answers that we could answer to that question, Um, but as I process that this week, I kind of boiled it down to these four things. A good dad is someone who loves unconditionally, who disciplines when necessary, who forgives always, and trains and equips. 
I would like to, with the rest of our time this morning, uh, address each one of those topics briefly. And my hope is to help paint a picture of who God is and the relationship that we have been created to have with him. There's a story in scripture that I love, and I believe that it is a story that encompasses um, all of these qualities. The story comes out of the book of John and is found in the beginning of chapter 8, starting in verse 2. So here we go again. John chapter 8, starting in verse 2. At dawn, he, meaning Jesus, appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? Now they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman. Still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Let's talk about this story for a moment. So Jesus appears at the temple courts and begins teaching. Now, when I read this story this week, it was so fun because just having come back from Israel, I was able to picture in my mind exactly what they were talking about. I could picture the temple courts and I could picture where everyone would be sitting. And just so you guys would know that this would be an incredibly crowded place. So when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law bring this woman out, they're doing so to humiliate her in in front of a lot of people and also to trap Jesus in front of a lot of people. Now, the teachers of the law are also known as scribes um, in scripture, and scribes had the knowledge of the law, and they could draft legal documents, contracts for marriage, divorce, loans, inheritance, mortgages, uh, sale of of land, things like that. And the Pharisees, we talk about them a lot here, um, were this hyper-religious party that were experts in the law, but Jesus was constantly rebuking these guys because they were noted for their self-righteousness and their pride. So these two groups of people, they bring this woman to Jesus who was caught in adultery and they're trying to trap Jesus because they knew that the law demanded the execution of this woman. But Rome had removed capital jurisdiction from Jewish courts except for temple violations. Thus, the Jewish leaders test whether Jesus will reject the law, compromising his patriotic Jewish following or reject Roman rule, which would allow them to accuse him to the Romans. Meaning if Jesus told them to stone her according to the law of Moses, it would be reported to the Roman government, which didn't permit Jews to execute their own people. If he let her go free, he would be charged with violating the law. So they purposely trap him with this question that there's no way out of. So instead of falling into their trap, what does Jesus do? The Bible says he leans over and begins to write in the sand. Now, the Bible doesn't say what he wrote down in the sand. Uh, I read a lot of Bible commentaries this week, and it's kind of fun because lots of people like to speculate about what he could have been writing. Some people like to think that he began to write out other people's sin, right? The people that were like ready to stone her start writing out their sin. And as they saw it, they realized what God was doing. Um, But we we don't actually know what he was writing. But whatever it was, it was clearly enough to change their minds. Because when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to cast a stone. Then he stood up and, con- and then he bent down, I'm sc- sorry, and continued to write on the ground. So one by one, they begin to leave, right? And then Jesus is the only one left with her. And he asks her, who condemns you? No one, sir, she said then neither do I condemn you, declared Jesus. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus did not condemn the woman, but he also didn't overlook her sin. He told her to go and leave her life of sin. He called her into action, and he's calling her into a transformed life. 
in this story with one woman's life literally in the balance because these guys are ready to stone her for her sin. Jesus exposes the sin in all of us. His answer leveled the playing field. The accusers become acutely aware of their own sin, lowering their heads. They walk away knowing they too deserve to be stoned for their sin. Then people, the people who came to trap Jesus and shame him, now leave in shame. This episode dramatically captured the gracious and merciful forgiving spirit of Jesus along with his firm call to a transformed life. This is why I love this story because in it we see that God is such a good father. In this story, we see unconditional love. We see discipline when necessary. We see forgiveness always. And then Jesus equips her with the very thing that she needs to expand the kingdom of God, the testimony of the gospel of grace. By Jesus telling this woman, go now and leave your life of sin, that implies a transformed life. And what do transformed people do? They tell others about it. They share their experiences because here's the reality. Just because Jesus extended forgiveness and grace to that woman prior to those guys wanting to stone her, right? Jesus extends forgiveness and grace. Those guys leave. God forgives this woman. That doesn't mean that the guys who were there forgot what that woman had done, right? Everyone was still very much aware of her sin and who she had been. There's no way they were going to forget that. But now, this woman, she doesn't get to live based on who she had been. She gets to live bound by who, she, by who saved her, right? This woman doesn't, get to, doesn't have to live bound by who she had been. She gets to live bound by who has saved her. And people are going to notice that. When someone's life has been radically changed, the people around them who knew them before, they notice a difference right? They notice a difference. People were going to notice. People are going to remember when your life has been changed. Jesus loved this woman so much that he doesn't condemn her, but he loved her so much that he challenged her to live differently. Jesus talks about this in John chapter 15. This is a chapter on the vine and the vine dresser and the importance of fruit. To illustrate discipline, Jesus talks about pruning. God rewards all growth with pruning. It doesn't only happen when something is wrong, okay? It's that if left unattended, vines will grow to a place where they bear little to no fruit because all of the energy of the vines is going to, is going to grow these big branches and to grow these leaves. And so God being who he is and being very concerned with fruit in our lives does whatever is needed to keep that priority in place. If we are left unchecked, our growth becomes in appearance, not in substance. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't care how long my branches look or how big the leaves look. I don't care about growth in appearance. I care about growth in substance. And that means that God has to do some pruning. And when he does, that means it's usually kind of painful. But it's always for our good. It's so easy to think that when bad, circum bad circumstances in our life happen, that that is God disciplining you. But we can see in scripture that that is inconsistent with the lesson Jesus teaches his disciples in John chapter 15. Because discipline done correctly serves and strangely unites. It never divides. I can tell you guys that firsthand. As a mom of little girls, when my daughter does something that requires discipline, we go to her room and we have a conversation about how what happened is why it's not allowed and how we should behave. It usually has both of us crying. Somehow there's some sort of, you know, discipline involved, not just conversation. And then at the end of it, I get to hug my little girl and I get to tell her that I love her. And we are more bonded and more connected and have grown in unity because discipline was done correctly because discipline done correctly never divides, always unites. Oftentimes, bad circumstances are brought out of natural consequences or reactions to bad decisions that we have made, right? We know that, but there are other times where bad things happen to good people for seemingly no reason at all. 
but because sin entered into the world, right? God created this perfect world, and when Adam and Eve brought sin into the world, everything changed. And now that sin is in the world and brokenness is here, bad things happen to good people that we can't explain all the time. And it's really, really sad, right? We know this. And that's why when this happens, and I mean, I'm sure every single one of you can attest to this, we know that it will. It is so important that we can stand on the truth that God is good even in the midst of the hard. You know, this specific topic of, of God's goodness in the midst of evil and in the midst of hard um, is actually going to be addressed next week. Harold Everly is going to be here with us and he's going to be sharing on that. Um, I'm really excited to hear him. But going back to, to the story from John chapter 8, the woman caught in adultery. Interestingly enough, Jesus is the only one who had never sinned. Therefore, he, rightly so, was the only one who could have stoned this woman, and yet he chooses to not stone her. Instead, he reveals the Father. And as I just shared what it looks like when I discipline one of my kids in the way that we just embrace and hug at the end, and we love each other, and everything's okay, what we see here in this story is a father-daughter moment between Jesus and this woman who had been caught in adultery. So as we wrap up this morning, I want to encourage us all, and this is going to sound kind of silly, to get to know God. Let's get to know God. I know that many of you in this room have been walking with Jesus for many, many years. But I know that there are others in this room that haven't even began to scratch the surface of getting to know who he is as I mentioned in the beginning of, of this message, I think that the concept of understanding God as a good father is particularly tricky. You know, I'm not, I'm not naive enough to think otherwise because for some, this concept of a good and loving God makes total sense to them because maybe you were one of the lucky ones who had a really good dad and maybe you had a good dad who loved you or at least a grandpa or an uncle or somebody in your life earned your trust. Somebody in your life showed you what it looks like to be loved well and to have a safe place. So the concept of God loving you as a father makes sense to you. But I know that there are other people that in their world and from their experiences, a concept of a loving God makes no sense because through every single one of your life experiences, it has showed you that you can't trust people. Maybe you can't trust men or you can't trust father figures. So if you're here this morning, maybe you've been tracking with us over the last several weeks as we have talked about the goodness of God but you yourself have yet to taste and see and truly experience his goodness. My prayer for you today and all week has been that you would open up yourself to the possibility of a relationship with this father. Because here's what I know. Orphans live differently from children who know that they are loved. Again, orphans live differently from children who know that they are loved. Self-preservation and self-promotion are not the driving points of the behavior of healthy children. Instead, the secure child is more inclined to celebrate the gift of another without beginning to feel insecure themselves. All around us are these hypothetical orphans, right? People who don't yet know the goodness of the Father, people who don't know what it is to have a relationship with God. They could be our neighbors, they could be our bosses, they could be our friends, it could be you sitting in this room here today. And if it is, may I be so bold as to tell you that life with Jesus is so much better. My purpose, my passion, my reason for being exists because of him. Now, if you feel timid or afraid of trusting God, and maybe you feel like somehow if you, if you choose to trust him that you're going to be disappointed again or that somehow it isn't safe, can I just tell you that God doesn't use fear as a tactic. He uses love. He uses grace. He uses joy to change us, to transform our lives. Therefore, there is no safer place than in the presence of God. And for those of you who are already believers, who have tasted and seen and experienced the goodness of God, our assignment moving forward is really simple. Do what Jesus did. 
Do what Jesus did. If Jesus came to earth to reveal the Father, then that is part of what we get to do too. John chapter 20 verse 21 states, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. In this passage, Jesus passes on uh, this part of his assignment to us. And in doing so, he defines our purpose in very much the same way as his, to love those around us, and by doing so, revealing the goodness of the Father. For Jesus, part of that was him going to the cross and dying for our sin, for our shame, for our brokenness, and for us as the benefactors of that sacrifice, we get to live in the freedom and the wholeness that can only be found in Christ. Would you pray with me this morning?